Hello, and welcome to What Comes to Mind, Season 2 of The Psychonaut Show. This is John K. Burton, MD, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and your host on this podcast that brings ideas from the history of psychoanalysis to solve problems in everyday life. In this episode, we're going to explore the concept of castration anxiety. Now, I wanted to do this episode because, like the topic of the Oedipus Complex last season, it's probably the archetype of the stereotype of those psychoanalytic concepts that basically get made fun of and not taken seriously these days. But the philosophy of The Psychonaut Show is that In doing that, we're throwing tools out, not to make a pun with castration anxiety, tools that are actually very useful to us, and we just need to know how to use them. So like magic spells, they have to be used in specific ways with skill and knowledge, or else they won't work, or even worse, they might cause some harm. Another reason that we're going to do this episode on castration anxiety is that it allowed me to go back into the Psychonaut Vault and dig up another piece of my conversation with that good witch, Dr. Clarice Kestenbaum. Before we get back into that conversation, let me just say briefly what castration anxiety really means. Obviously, castration anxiety is the boy's fear that his penis is going to be cut off. Now, technically, that's actually not castration. Castration is the removal of the gonads, both in males and in females, it stops the sex hormones from reaching the rest of the body. That is the definition of castration. So technically, it's a fear of a penectomy. So that's being very semantic, but let's get back to the psychoanalytic idea and why castration anxiety is meaningful. It basically boils down to the idea that the body is very important. We have psychological investment in the body, and the fear of harm coming to it motivates us in many ways and certain parts of the body are more important than others because of their feeling because of their meaning because of many things and in this case the penis is the part of the body where a lot of emotion and feeling is invested so dr kestenbaum is going to tell us about a couple of cases where the concept of castration anxiety was very important We had a little boy, he was, this was the kindergarten, he was five, and the teacher said, this little boy is running around with a yellow paintbrush and he's trying to paint everybody and he calls it poison pee. And we found out that he urinated in the yellow can, the paint can, Mm -hmm. and we don't understand why. So without calling in his mother or anything yet, I went to talk to the little boy and he said, it's because my pee is poison. I said, why, why would your pee be poison? No, it is. And he was showing me that he was painting with the yellow paint, and then he was chasing little boys, in the, or girls too, in the room with the paintbrush and calling it poison pee. So at that point, I called in the mother, a school consultant. I said, tell me, he was so wonderful last year, according to the teachers, what happened this year? She said, well, um, he had to have um, tonsillectomy, and he had it, believe it or not, at my own hospital, Columbia Presbyterian, which we did not have very good CL then. Mm-hmm. Parents didn't stay in the room with them. They didn't understand about attachment and the need for the parent. I mean, they did a tonsillectomy. And, but then they decided when they examined the boy that he had phimosis, a condition of the penis where they found that he needed to have a circumcision, mm-hmm. that he was having difficulty. And that where the it, foreskin is too tight. It's too and, tight. Yeah. And was too tight. So they decided without telling him or anybody. So he woke up from the anesthesia. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and he had, oh, and he had the you know, tonsillectomy. Oh. So he was given jello and ice cream. Oh. But then he sees there's a bandage on his penis and it was sore and it hurt. And he thought that there was something very wrong. First, he thought his penis was cut off. Mm-hmm. And then he thought that there was something very wrong with it, but it was definitely poisoned poison pee. And I said to the mother, did you, did they not tell you? No. 
Well, did you not tell the school that he had had this? No, I didn't think it was important. Well, no one had thought it was important, neither the surgeons. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a very mm -hmm. good consultation liaison. They had never called anybody. So here I am with this little boy. Now, before we see how the idea of castration anxiety helped this family figure out the problem, let's look a little more deeply into the theory behind it. Now, the thing about nurses who know the difference, they know that little boys have discovered their penis and they're going to play with it. Why did all the German children have to have their tans folded on the table mm -hmm. on top or on top of the covers as if they're not thinking that there is a self-stimulation, that there is masturbation? Everybody knew Freud was considered a dirty old man because, mm -hmm. look, he's bringing what everybody sees and knows mm -hmm. to consciousness, to mm -hmm. awareness, I should say. Mm -hmm. And people said, no, look at its sexual perversion. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of castration anxiety. Little boys were told that their fingers, their thumbs would be cut off if they played with themselves or masturbated. And it, it's so important that so many symptoms came from having to repress these completely normal, natural urges. Mm -hmm. It's particularly important when symptoms develop in adolescence with children who have had that either from religious point of view or very strict upbringing, and a boy will have a nocturnal emission and think something horrible has happened or is something terrible that he's either being poisoned, something bad is happening to him. So as Dr. Kessenbaum points out, the idea of castration anxiety is not something uh, shocking or out of the ordinary. It's something that everybody observes and sees. Freud himself talked about his experience as a child having to go to the bathroom and he had to go to the bathroom when they didn't have bathrooms. They had chamber pots and the chamber pot was in his parents' room in the middle of the night and he went in and he woke up his father who told his mother that voice never going to amount to anything, anything as Freud, little, little Siggy is peeing into the chamber pot. So he definitely had his own childhood experience with his father criticizing him while his penis was being revealed. And flashing forward into about the year 1900, around that time, Freud had put together his theories about infantile sexuality in which castration anxiety plays such an important role. The reason that it's important in psychoanalytic theory is that it's a crucial piece of the Oedipus complex. The fear of losing the penis, of having it cut off, is what causes the boy to let go of the desire to have his mother and to get rid of his father, or as we talked about in the episode, in general in the triangle, to have one parent and get rid of the other. In Freud's theory, it's the fear of this punishment that puts him back in line and allows him to develop and internalize the idea of the parents instead of wanting to have them. So castration anxiety is sort of the linchpin around this idea in development. And it really has to do with the importance and meaning that the body has and the fear of harm happening to the body that makes it so powerful and meaningful. I should mention here the case of little Hans, which Freud used to validate his theories about castration anxiety and the Oedipus complex and generally his ideas about infantile sexuality. The case of little Hans came to him in 1908 through his friend, who is simply known as the father in the case. And really the case of little Hans is the first case of child psychoanalysis, though it is done through Freud talking to the father. Freud only met the boy once. And so it's also the first case of parent guidance. And anyway, the story is that little Hans developed a terrible phobia of horses, which was a big problem in Vienna in the 1900s because they didn't have cars, so everywhere you had to go, you had to go in a carriage with horses. And he had seen a horse fall on the street and sort of thrash about in the carriage turnover, and he developed a fear of even going out of the house that then became clarified as a fear of the horses. And Freud and his father talked together, and then his father would ask questions of 
little Hans and he would tell him dreams and his associations. And he came to the idea that he was worried that the horse would bite his Whittler off. And I'm not sure what the German is. Obviously, Whittler was his penis and it has something to do with whittling or peeing. This was the Strachey's translation of the German. And Freud interpreted that this was really about his father punishing him because he said the father sort of looked like a horse with his sort of Edwardian facial hair and a, and a goatee kind of, kind of style that might look like a horse. Anyway, it goes into a lot more detail in the case history. It's been debated a lot, but this is a big part of where the idea of castration coming from the father was a punishment for the child's wanting his mother over his father. And the idea that I'm going to lose my penis because I was trying to win something is what makes me retreat and keep me in line. So this is something that really is about the fear of success, the fear of winning, the, the fear of entering the competition, that it gets embodied as an actual physical punishment and a loss. Interestingly, little Hans, it's known who he is. His name was Herbert Graf. He's dead now. But he actually became a very successful opera producer later in his life, staged operas internationally in Vienna, Italy. And he was actually at the Metropolitan Opera in New York for more than 15 years in the middle of the 20th century. Now, obviously, this is about the penis and this is about the boy. Some have said that penis envy is the equivalent in girls and makes for a different kind of development. Other theorists later have tried to apply other kinds of ideas, similarly saying that there's an anxiety that causes us to fear entering the competition. And uh, another theorist and analyst, Karen Gilmore, who is actually a teacher and friend of mine, has written about what she calls cloacal anxiety in the girls, which has to do with confusion about the genitalia and anxiety about entering the competition because of that. And a major theme in all of this is what is the impact of inner reality, our fantasies, our ideas, and what is outer reality, what society gives us. One of the earliest women theorists in psychoanalysis, Karen Horney, was very much a Freudian, but she said that it was important to think about society and the impact that it has on a girl's penis envy and other kinds of things in terms of infantile sexuality, that it's not all about what is coming from the inside with the child's fantasies, but what society puts on it. And again, the importance of balancing the inner reality and the outer reality is what helps us understand when these kinds of spells and magic of psychoanalysis is going to be useful. You can't do it in the wrong situation. And the cases that Dr. Kestenbaum is going to tell us about, the case of the boy with the poison pee, and then she's going to tell us about another case, both give examples of how, when, and when not to use these concepts. But now let's go back and hear how Dr. Kestenbaum dealt with that first case of the boy with the poison pee. I just had graduated from both the Columbia child training I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. When I say nothing, in those years, we didn't know very much. And we got together in small groups, some of the, the residents, to teach ourselves to do the readings that we could. But I was replacing Margaret Mahler in the Hudson Guild Nursery. And the teachers were very upset and angry that, uh, that here this novice is coming in to teach them after they'd had this world-famous, brilliant, wonderful, now-retiring child psychoanalyst, you know, it was, it was terrible for me because I didn't know anything. And I had some very bad experiences, except one day it all turned around. So you'll know that Clarice mentions Mahler. Who was Mahler? Just briefly, it's a little bit of a digression, but it's important to put, it's important to know who she was. Margaret Mahler was another sort of historical figure. She was a major thinker in working with children. She was a psychoanalyst. But like Anna Freud, she actually used observation of children and also how children related to their parents, particularly their mothers, to come up with her own theories. So she tried to look at what was going on in outer reality as well as inner reality. 
Her main concept was the idea of separation individuation, which tells us how we begin to become separate from our mothers, how we begin to become ourselves and maintain our relationship with our mothers. But we'll get into a whole episode on separation individuation and how it's important in our everyday lives in the next season, season three. Let's go back to the case. So what I did was I took a little clay dough, plasticine doll and we made a penis on it and we said your penis had a little tiny problem right here on the tip and they just cut that off so that you would have no more problem and it's completely your penis is fine and it's not poison at all and you don't have poison pee at all and I had him paint with the blue with the red um, with the yellow and a friend came over in the room they had been afraid of him because he had been running around after them. And he picked up a brush, and they started painting together. And I said, you see, you had... This was in the nursery. In, it was in, well, in the, in the kindergarten class uh -huh, uh -huh. at the Hudson Guild. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And not in the office, not anywhere, right. just as a consultant. Yeah, yeah. I had explained to the mother that, it was very, that he was very frightened, because in his inner world, there was something terribly wrong with him. And he was bad. He mm. was had defective. And I explained everything. We, had, we showed the model of the doll. We showed the, the paint and that he was fine. And that, that was it. We didn't need a long psychoanalysis. We didn't need even a session in the office. It was done in the nursery and I think in, in the school. It's very important for teachers and consultants to be very aware of these things before you recommend a big treatment. Mm -hmm. Although I have recommended treatment when it was really necessary. So now let's hear about another case that Dr. Kestenbaum discussed with me. And again, together they show us the power of psychoanalysis and that it can be great, but you have to know what are the right circumstances for the magic to work. Or if you use it incorrectly, it will backfire. I'll tell you another example. Mm -hmm. We had a child come in to Columbia General Resident Training where I saw the children through a one-way mirror one week with the resident, and the other residents watched. And the next room, the parents were being interviewed by residents. It was all filmed, and then we could discuss it the following week. So we had one little boy who was absolutely adorable but wild. He said that he was the ninja man and that he could beat up everybody in school, kids were afraid of him because what he did was thoroughly disgusting. He had always mucus coming from his mm -hmm. nose, we call it snot, that he would eat mm -hmm. or then take his finger and, like the poison pea, mm -hmm. go and touch little boys. He was wild, he was active, and he was completely unmanageable. So they bring him to the, to the class. So he was playing with the ninja. And he said, I'm the ninja man. I can beat up everybody. I can knock down the house. And he went through stories of blow the house down and the ninja could do it. And I said, well, let's pretend that we'll get the ninja horse. One of the residents played the ninja horse. And he can beat the ninja man because he wants to teach him to be good and not hurt everybody and not kill everybody because he was knocking down everybody and killing everybody. We want him to be good. So he played for a couple of minutes, and then he said, no, I was just fooling. I'm really the ninja man, and I can kill everybody and hurt everybody. Mm -hmm. And he jumped, or he was adorable. So it was, a, it was a conflict that a you, conflict. you brought out. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the snot was one side of the conflict, yes. the, the, the ag aggressive side, mm -hmm. I guess we could say. And then you were embodying what right. you knew was there was another but side. i didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. so i had the parents in and this was one with with the residents mm -hmm. this was one of the most hilarious ever the mother said he has had terrible sinus problems and he is going to have some hearing loss and we we know that he is um, been very sick. The surgeons have recommended, you know, sinus therapy. Plus, he has some speech impediment. It's hard to understand him all the time. And he's socially inept. But we are very worried that we don't want the operation during the castration period. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we didn't, we withholding surgery. Uh -huh. I practically yelled at the uh -huh. parents. Uh -huh. I said, he needs immediately surgery. You call the surgeon. He has signed a surgery. He's going to lo lose his hearing. His speech is impaired. He's got to have the surgery now. Then we'll decide. 
what he needs, then I would recommend changing schools. It was time anyway that he go to another school in the district where all the kids don't see him and know him. And third, he's going to need some speech therapy first, just for the language and the speech. And fourth, he's going to need to have, I believe, some psychological treatment because of his feelings about himself, identifying, I explained to them, with the aggressor. So they, they did listen. So he had in steps. And everybody said, why can't you do it all at once? I didn't believe in that. I thought it should be one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. First, the surgery, which was fine. And he needed it desperately. He had tubes put in the ears. He had, you know, very important sinus surgery because he was very impaired physically. And the ENT people had said that for years. Secondly, I told him I didn't believe that it was it, that surgery is more important than, quote, the period of castration anxiety. Mm -hmm. No, he's going to be fine. I sent him to a new school. I mean, they went to a new school where he didn't know people. He got three months of speech therapy, and it was a family in Westchester they, you know, could afford. And then I sent him to one of our colleagues with a movie. And, you know, he only had six months of treatment of playing out the fantasies, but now he had friends, and he was doing very, very well in school. And he was just an incredibly great kid. So this second case, the case of the ninja boy, is an example of what I've called before the Greek oracle phenomenon back in the episode on the return of the repressed. The Greek oracle phenomenon is when the thing that you do to get away from or avoid the thing that you're afraid of actually makes the thing that you're afraid of come true. So in this case, the parents were afraid of causing a conflict or a neurosis in the period of castration anxiety. And the thing that they did, which was to avoid surgery, is actually the thing that caused problems. So I actually saw the video of this boy, of the ninja, and of Dr. Kestenbaum bringing in the ninja horse to make him pull himself together and create a, a stronger ego. Going back to the last episode on the models of the mind, the aggressive id was too strong in this boy and she was trying to strengthen his ego this time as a horse itself but it didn't work i could see in the video and in, in, if you were to see it you would see as well that he he wants to go along with it and he just rejects it because his inner world his needing to be strong and destroy things is just too powerful and this is what she meant when she said he went into treatment to play out the fantasy. The treatment inevitably dealt with his sense of inadequacy that was about his bodily experience. So in that way, it largely falls under the category of castration anxiety, but it wasn't about the penis. It was about actually the ears, nose, and throat, another part of the body, another part of the body that has feeling and is emotional, and for this boy was more important. I have a follow-up. Yeah. One day, a young man came to see me. He was 20 years old, and he said, do you remember me, Dr. Kestenbaum? I'm Jimmy. Mm -hmm. I, he had seen the film. What was he? He was a pre-med, and he was working in a lab, and he wanted to be a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. And he was just doing beautifully. Mm -hmm. And he came after all these years to say he remembered and that he, he had a wonderful treatment, only a few months. But I knew that that intervention was essential. Other interventions, like the one in the nursery school with poison pee, was not. And it's very important to learn the difference of when you really need to intervene. So as we talked about the role of inner and outer reality are equally important. And the history of psychoanalysis is about the struggle to strike that balance, to understand the importance of the inner world, especially the unconscious, which we don't see, but also to appreciate the meaning and context that the outer world gives. In talking about this, one of the best stories that I know of that illustrate the terrible imbalance that can sometimes occur is a story about Melanie Klein, who was supervising John Bowlby. John Bowlby, um, we're talking about a lot of names here today, Margaret Mahler, et cetera, and now John Bowlby. He was very important for basically coming up with the theory of attachment, that, that a baby needs to have one constant caregiver, usually the mother, and that 
That role can't just be replaced by anyone. We're going to talk about attachment again in season three. A lot of teasers for season three we're talking about in this episode. At any rate, Melanie Klein was supervising John Bowlby on his analytic case. And this case was a child who had a schizophrenic mother. And John Bowlby would go to Melanie Klein and say, I'm very concerned about the mother. She seems to be coming psychotic. And Melanie Klein would say, it doesn't matter. You're supposed to focus on this child's inner world, only his fantasies, the outer world makes no difference. And the mother kept getting sicker and sicker. And John Bowlby would go to Melanie Klein and she would tell him to stay with the fantasy. And the real mother didn't matter until one day the mother was hospitalized and the child was put into foster care. And John Bowlby went to Melanie Klein and said, I don't have a case anymore because the mother has been hospitalized and the child's in foster care. And Melanie Klein said, well, I guess you'll have to get another case. So the mission of The Psychonaut Show is to strike that balance. We are exploring the inner worlds and appreciating the unconscious. But it doesn't mean that we're not thinking about reality. It's about expanding our awareness of the things that influence us. Now I want to apply some of what we have learned exploring the concept of castration anxiety with the good witch Dr. Kestenbaum and apply it to some situations that come up with adults, especially in the social and political time we are living in today. The privilege of my job is that people share with me their inner worlds, and these are worlds that you don't read about in the news or hear about on TV or Twitter. I have learned that it's not just a joke that the penis has enormous meaning, no pun intended. Again, it's hard to avoid Freudian slips on this topic. Now, being a man, I'm not completely ignorant of this meaning myself, but it has been so striking to me to meet so many individual men, old and young, gay and straight, who suffer intense anxiety about their penises, their size, their ability to work. The penis is a synecdoche. That means the part stands for the whole. So it is a symbol of something more profound, how a man feels in the world, worthy or inadequate, good or bad. So it's really not ultimately about the penis, but as Dr. Kestenbaum explained in the earlier episode, the physical difference does matter. And it's all over the media. We see this in men's magazines as well as women's magazines, articles written by women about how size matters and detailing their own experience of having to deal with little penises and the man's insecurity about it. And this is applauded as female empowerment, but it's not really. It's just clickbait, because what man isn't going to feel compelled to read about that? And in the end, it causes nothing but self-consciousness and anxiety. I even know a mother who always refers to her six-year-old's little penis. And I just want to tell her she should be more mindful of how he experiences his penis and his body, and it's not so little for him at age six. The penis is exposed and can be seen and becomes a symbol of a man's worthiness. And here I'm talking not only about value, how big and hard and long can it go, but also goodness. For many men, their sexuality feels that it is inherently evil. In this era of Me Too, women are reclaiming their bodies, which have felt under attack. And there is nothing more important than that, nothing more important than feeling that your body belongs to you. But in some corners, there is a dark side which says that it is the penis and those who own one that are the enemy. And this predates me too. And it even predates modern feminism, third wave, second wave, and first wave. A woman I know remembers feeling sorry for the boys in her Orthodox Hebrew school who had classes teaching them how they needed to fear the feelings in their penis, what harm it could cause, and how sinful it is. It's not Eve's apple that is the source of original sin, but the penis. Now recently, to bring it to the current time, a friend of mine has a child in kindergarten and she told me of an incident at school. Now this had been a difficult year. There was the loss of a teacher, the classes were overcrowded, and there was a lot of chaos and the kids were feeling anxious. And the school discovered that someone had been peeing where they weren't supposed to. Now instead of talking to the children about what might be bothering them and handling the problem that way, the school administration decided to call the parents of all the boys together and made it about finding who would commit such a heinous and antisocial act. And if it's not clear, I'm being sarcastic. Remember, these are five-year-olds, the same age as little Hans. 
And my friend recalls being caught up in the anxiety and feared that her son was the culprit. But in retrospect, she observed that the school's approach was to put all the boys in the role of criminals, and again, because they had a penis. I've seen many young men who have a sense that society looks at them as inherently dangerous and not just black men. One young man I know who's into anime and comics said that he felt that in the movie Mad Max, the new one with Tom Hardy, not the original, I'm so sorry. that the premise of the movie is that maleness is original sin and women are naturally good. The plot revolves, according to him, around the man choosing good because women change him. And he said, in comics in general, male villains don't need backstories, though women villains always need a backstory because we assume that men are bad. Now, we can argue with this particular reading of Mad Max and comics in general, but the point is that many young men are feeling this way. And by the way, speaking of Tom Hardy, there's an example of a man who transcends this obsession with the meaning of the penis without sacrificing his masculinity. I don't know if many of you remember a while ago, a bunch of pictures of him went around where he was naked except for his underwear. And there were a lot of jokes made about the size of his penis. You could see its shape in the underwear and that he was kind of soft and not muscular. But his response was not to get defensive. He didn't let it define him. He accepted both reality and fantasy and his self-awareness as a man transcended both. I honestly can't think of an actor who embodies masculinity and real strength more than he does. I want to tell you about a case of a man who struggled with this unconscious feeling of shame about his maleness and how he overcame it. This was a man who was in his 50s and was divorced when I saw him. And he had a pattern of ending up with women who expected that he take care of them and make up for the injustices that they had experienced in the past. And ultimately, he always ended up feeling like he was the cause of all of their problems. His ex-wife was an attorney but had stopped working even though their child was in high school and the family could have used the extra income. She was dismissive of gifts he would give her and she would demand that she be adored completely, physically, though she showed no interest or admiration for him physically. He ended up meeting another woman and left his wife. And this is another example of the return of the repressed. He was trying to be a good guy by staying in a bad situation and that ended up with him taking an action that was actually hurtful. But as we looked at his past relationships, we saw that this was a pattern. As a teenager, he recalled being on a hike with the girl and falling, getting a really serious laceration on his leg that should have sent him to the ER for stitches. But he was afraid that she would think he was weak if he showed how serious it was, and so he washed it himself and just went home. Later in his life, a girlfriend even broke his nose when she had gotten drunk and told him he was being a baby when he complained about it hurting, not when it was actually broken, but later on. And this pattern would even happen at work when he would overperform, clocking in overtime nightly for his female bosses. But somehow he would always end up feeling scapegoated for the larger problems in the companies he worked for. Even the relationship with his new girlfriend fell into this pattern. She was, on the surface, completely different from his ex-wife. She was younger and beautiful and successful in her own career, but after a while, she ended up belittling his own career achievements, and at the same time, she said he was holding her back, and that he couldn't understand her struggles because he was part of the patriarchy. Now, one day this man told me, it hit me like a bolt. I have a script, and I'm playing it out. And he said that in this script, the man is always evil. No matter what he might do, he's always in the wrong, while the woman is righteous because of her experience with cruel men. That was his script. And then he connected this to his own experience growing up with an abusive father and a loving mother, but also other images of men that he had experienced, like those we talked about earlier. So his problem was that he had to figure out how to be a man, a human with a penis, but not be like his abusive father. And the unconscious solution was to allow himself to be condemned to play the role that a certain type of woman wanted. He could not allow himself to see himself as the victim. That wasn't part of the script. And part of the script, too, was that sexual action itself was bad. So the solution was to be submissive. Why? Because to be a man was to be bad, and therefore so were the penis and sexual action, since that is how one 
feels oneself to be a man. So unconsciously and symbolically, he had castrated himself. So how did this man eventually break free? A crucial piece was finding positive self-esteem in the company of men who enjoyed things that he associated with being bad, like taking action and enjoying speed. He had always sought out women to reassure him about his inherent goodness, but he needed to learn that his maleness was positive in itself. And he found a group of men who drove race cars. And in the company of these men, he felt the pure joy of racing and driving fast of aggression. Now, of course, the race car was a phallic symbol, not surprisingly, but it wasn't a character. It actually was meaningful. It was a metaphor that was expansive, not reducing. He said that you can't stop the speed and action of the car while you're racing or you will crash. In other words, to put it in the metaphor, if you try to stop the action, that's where you're going to screw up. And that's what he had been doing his whole life. What he learned and what he said about the racing was you have to go into the fear of losing control when you're racing down the track and turning a corner. You can't put on the brakes. You have to trust and lean into it. And that's what keeps you from crashing. And that's where the joy comes. It was a paradox. He said that he had to learn how to take care of his masculinity, not show up to be emasculated. Taking care of meant being aware of his inherent goodness, going back to Testament number three. But this man found on his own a masculinity that was joyful and constructive and healing. Now he broke up with the girlfriend who would blame him for her problems and being part of the patriarchy, and he started dating again. But he saw these patterns coming up again. With his new girlfriend, he would sometimes have trouble getting an erection, and she became angry at him for not being able to perform sexually. But in this case, rather than fall into that role, they were able to talk about it. And eventually she was even able to have empathy for him. And she even said, It must be hard to have a penis. People joke about it's hard to be a man and are sarcastic about that. And of course, it's hard to be a human being. And going back to our interview with Dr. Kestemaum, to me, she represents the ultimate strong woman. She empathizes. She doesn't condemn the aggressive behavior. She really tries to understand and be curious. So what is the lesson here? The lesson is that maybe size matters, but how it matters and what meaning it takes is up to us. The body has meaning and the penis is part of the body. It's a part that has a lot of feeling and it's a part that connotes the difference between the genders. It's a part that feels like it can be lost easily, therefore there's a lot of anxiety around it. And in terms of Freud's idea of castration anxiety, it feels like it's the punishment for competing, for trying to do one's best and get what one wants. And therefore it can become part of what prevents one from achieving success. Ultimately, this all relates to how we understand the world through our bodies, which is our next episode on the podcast on the body ego. And we're going to go beyond the penis and castration anxiety and talk about a lot of different ways that we understand the world through our bodies. Now, this episode focused on boys, but it's relevant to society as a whole, all genders. Boys are fragile. They're children. But only by treating people as equals, all people, while recognizing the realities of our differences, can we solve our problems. And another lesson here, or at least a reminder, is that the mission of The Psychonaut Show is knowledge, because it can be helpful even curing problems. But we have to know the right conditions for using that knowledge. That's the essential ingredient of our magic. We talked about the uses and misuses of the idea of castration anxiety in Dr. Kestenbaum's cases, and really knowing the difference between fantasy and reality, outer reality versus inner reality, is the essential ingredient.
Now, I always say that understanding these ideas helps us to be more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily life. And a lot of people always ask, how does it make us more attractive? Well, I think that when we see each other's value, including the value and importance of the body itself, and appreciate each other in this way, and each other's experience, nothing can be more attractive or sexy than that. This is Dr. JKB signing off. So that was really fun. Right. Right. It sounds like you guys could go for hours. We, we could go for hours and hours. We all have incredible stories yeah. and experiences and million patients. And, uh, you know, it's really, it's true. So it's a great, uh, I loved the podcast when I first heard it. You know, you showed it because I thought this is bringing to the world something very important to the, mm -hmm. I thought, to the lay public. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, teachers, social workers. Sure, yeah. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything, and remember... There's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O.